myths and mysteries about money. Um, the, there's no simple solution to the urgent challenges that Tom has pointed out in, in his presentation. Um, changing the monetary system won't do it alone. We need a, a whole system approach that includes many different actions. But the monetary system is, uh, is very important. As Gary said, the key question is social power, and money is one of the most powerful uh, levers in society. So a key question then is, who controls the creation and management of the money supply? Uh, and this is one of the things I think that people in the future will look back on the way we look back on slavery. Because we, there's, there's a great debate in the United States uh, in, the, in the forming um, about uh, basically about private versus public sector money creation. And we allow the private sector to create uh, money through fractional reserve lending. And that creates a lot of problems in society. Uh, once, and the, the only thing that keeps it in place, I would say, is probably lack of public awareness about all the benefits of public sector money creation and all the problems with private sector money creation. So I was just going to summarize a few of the, uh, the problems with uh, the current money creation system and then um, talk about how we can transition to a, a public sector money creation. So. Um, uh, in the, in the early U.S., Alexander Hamilton advocated the system that we now have in place in the U.S. and in most other countries. Most countries create their money supply, or almost all of it, through fractional reserve lending. In the U.S., 90% of the money supply is created by lending. And just for those who aren't familiar with it, the way it works is banks are often required to keep a 10% reserve requirement. So if somebody deposits $1,000 in the bank, they have to keep 100, but they can loan out 900. As soon as they do, they've created $900 of new money out of thin air. The original depositor has access to their 1,000. The borrower can use the 900. That borrower can put the money in the bank, and that bank keeps 90 and loans out 810. Now the 1,000's grown to 2,700. At a 10% reserve requirement, the banking system can grow a $1,000 deposit to $10,000 and create $9,000 of new money out of thin air. That's how money is created in the US and, and most other countries. So what happens then, there's many problems with that. One is cost. Say the government runs a deficit, uh, banks create money out of, uh, out of thin air, loan it to government, and taxpayers pay interest on it. In the US, that's $400 billion a year. If we, the people, created the money ourselves, we pay no interest. In addition, when we allow banks to create the money supply instead of the people, which would be democracy, we lose a lot of interest income revenue. That's about another $100 billion a year. So it costs US citizens about $500 billion a year to allow banks to create the money supply. That's nearly half of federal individual income taxes. So if we took, if we, uh, took back control of the money supply, we could cut taxes nearly in half. Another, in that, another issue is um, there would be almost no national debt or deficit spending if we, the people, created the money supply. You often hear, uh, especially on conservative media, talking about the need to cut social welfare programs to lower the national debt, but neither the conservatives or the liberals point out that there would be little or, little or no national debt if we weren't allowing banks to create the money supply. Another one is, um, is control. In the US, the Federal Reserve controls the money supply. That's completely owned by banks. So the, the creation and management of the money supply is not democratic in the US, our, which violates our constitution, because we, the people, implicitly have the power to create money. The constitution assigns it that power to Congress, plus broader powers, and it doesn't assign the right to create money to banks. Um, also, another one is focus. When banks create the money supply, the goal of the money supply is maximizing the shareholder returns of bank owners. So the banks, in, uh, by deciding they control the money supply by deciding who gets loans, and often they put the money into risky investments. If we, the people, control the money supply, we could channel it into infrastructure, education, uh, new, uh, new homes and stuff, so beneficial purposes. Another one is um, complexity. When, um, when banks create money, they're not, re create, they're not really creating money, they're creating debt. So the money supply is constantly expanding as new loans are made and contracting as loans are paid off. This creates a very unstable money supply. If we, the people, created money through government, then money would actually be money. It wouldn't disappear 
when, when loans were repaid. Now, the Federal Reserve tries to manage the money supply with open market operations, reserve requirements, the federal funds rate, um, but it's like trying to herd cats. The way they control the money supply is by increasing or reducing lending, uh, and it's very difficult to do. If we had one entity creating money instead of tens of thousands of financial institutions, it would be much easier uh, to manage. Okay, another one is um, economic instability. Uh, during recessions, often loans are paid back and banks are reluctant to lend again. That can shrink the money supply and expand the recession. If we had public, uh, a public created money supply, there would, be no, uh, there would be plenty of availability of credit during recessions. And I'll explain how this works. And then one other, one other problem with it is when, when the banks create the money supply, they control interest rates and, the, and they're a lot higher than they need to be. We got rid of the usury laws in the U.S. during deregulation in the 1980s. Red interest rates were capped at 10% in, in 48 states. Uh, now bank, banks can charge up to 30%. If we, the people, control the money supply, uh, interest rates would be lower and the need to pay interest would be lower. Um, and that, having to um, pay off existing debt by issuing new debt is a main cause, that, cause of the need for economic growth. If we were creating the money supply, there would be a lot less pressure to unsustainably always grow the economy. I know we often talk about economic growth and how important that is. That's suicidal. Nature seeks balance instead of growth. It's one of the laws we're violating. I'm kind of shorthanding that one. Okay, so if we were to reclaim uh, our right to create the money supply, banks would lose hundreds of billions of dollars per year of revenue. They, will, they couldn't come out and say, we oppose this transition because we make less revenue. The people would say, so what? We're going to do it. So they have to lie, basically. And, and what, they, what they would say would, um, arguments might be government's incompetent, government can't do anything well. It's impractical to switch to public money creation. It'll lead to inflation. It'll lead to lack of credit. All of those are invalid. It'll lead to a more stable uh, money supply with higher availability of credit during a recession. Um, it, it, impractical, impractical has to do with public opinion. If the people understood how unjust, how much money the system costs them, how they're not controlling their destiny through wealth, then it would become impractical to not transition to a, a public money supply. So the question then is how do we do it? The American Monetary Association at monetary.org has studied this extensively and they have a proposal for it. It would be actually very easy to do. All we would uh, do is uh, make the Fed part of the U.S. Treasury. For example, the, the, the Fed during the um, bailouts in 2008, we spend up to $12 trillion to bail out uh, speculators and, and CDSs and things like that. A lot of that came from the Fed. The Fed, Fed obligations often become obligations of the U.S. Treasury, meaning taxpayers. So what happened during the bailouts is the banks, since they control the Fed, essentially bailed themselves out using taxpayer money without taxpayer permission and without even telling taxpayers how they use their money because the Fed doesn't have to disclose to the public what they do with the money. It's a huge injustice. So to, to transition it, we would make the Fed part of the U.S. Treasury and we would require 100% bank reserves. So 100% bank reserves. So what that would mean is that government would create money, banks would borrow it from the government at a low interest rate, which we would use, that's our money, we'd use that to lower taxes, and then they would loan it out at a higher rate and make their money on the spread. Now when banks create money out of thin air, there's no cost to it. So except for overhead, the interest is pure profit to banks because we've given them that wealth generating mechanism. Um, okay, so just um, uh, in terms of how to make it happen, one of the most important things is raise public awareness. If the people understood how grossly unfair this, this system is, they, they wouldn't tolerate it. Another one is you can use investing to get companies to drive system change, including changes uh, like this. So I can just read, I, I just wanted to read a couple of quotes quickly from some of the historical figures in the US about this because there's been opposition to government created money since the very beginning. Um, Thomas Jefferson said, the Bank of the United States is one of the most deadly hostilities existing against the principles and form of our Constitution. I deem no government safe which is under the vassalage of any self-constituted authorities 
or any other authority than that of the nation. Meaning, if the, the, the bank, the U.S. bank back then wasn't controlled by the people like the Fed is, and that, that violates our Constitution. In, 19, in 1896, William Jennings Bryant, a uh, candidate for president, said, we say in our platform that we believe that the right to coin and issue money is a function of government. We believe it, we believe that it is part of our sovereignty and can no more be safe, no more with safety be delegated to private individuals than we could afford to delegate a private to private individuals the power to make penal statutes or levy taxes. Those who who are opposed to this proposition tell us that the issue of paper money is a function of the bank and that the government ought to go out of the banking business. I stand with Jefferson rather than with them and tell them, as he did, that the issue of money is a function of government and that the banks ought to go out of the governing business. When we have restored the money of our Constitution, all other necessary reforms will be possible. But until this is done, there is no other reform that can be accomplished. And then I won't read the whole quote, but Wright Hackman in 1941, the head of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, said that he basically thought it was idiotic that we, when, when we allow banks to create money, the money belongs to the people, but we're paying interest to use our own money. So we're talking about the Panama Canal, that costs 50 million plus 75 million. So we paid 125 million for something that would have, that would have only cost us 50 million if we, the people, had created the money supply. And then one last quote from Milton Friedman, who said, I share the view that the creation of fiat currency should be a government monopoly. And then later in 1985, he said, I have not given up advocacy of 100% reserves. So that's, uh, those are a few points about the injustice of private sector money creation and the massive benefits. I know there's a lot of monetary issues, but this is, this is something that could hugely benefit society. We could channel the wealth into protecting the environment and society instead of using the money supply to maximize the wealth, the uh, income of bank owners and, and others.